the motivation. Yeah. Um, I'm Ken Lewis uh, with the Sheriff's Office. Been there for 18 years of that time. Uh, 17 of that's been doing crime scene. Prior to that, a uh, road deputy here in Shawnee County, and then I was also road deputy in a, another jurisdiction south, uh, uh, south, uh, kind of south and west of here in Emporia, where I was a road deputy there. Uh, worked in detention for a few years too, uh, and then prior to that, I did uh, five years active duty military, military police, and. I was an investigator with the military police. Come off active duty. Come on in, have a seat. Did you bring the donuts? <laughs> you could have brought some cookies. Well, cookies would have worked. <laughs> and that thing about cops and donuts, not this one. I don't do donuts. So, but I thought that was a good way to break the ice. Uh, so, uh, prior to that, I was active duty and then come off active duty, went to college, and uh, stayed in the reserve, so I retired out of the military as well in 2006. But uh, this has been, come on in and have a seat. This has been uh, exciting for me as far as doing this kind of job. Uh, Shawnee County Sheriff Crime Scene, we do crime scene investigation for primarily the county, but if the city calls us, says, hey, can you come out and give us a hand with this, that, or the other, then uh, we'll come out there and, and help them. Uh, we don't just go in and take over a scene. Uh, jurisdictionally, I guess technically we could. We could be that FBI guy that walks in. I'm Agent Johnson. This is Agent Johnson, and we're here to take over. <laughs> but uh, we don't like to do that because that means more work, and it's fun until you have to do all the paperwork, and that's the part that sucks. So I'm gonna kill you a little bit with a little death by PowerPoint here. But I did bring some good pictures, so we'll have some good pictures to show and we'll talk about them. And I'm gonna kind of flip through this a little fast um, just because it's just that death by PowerPoint. Physical evidence, I'm not gonna go through and read them to you, but these are the things that we're looking for. There's two kinds of evidence. There's uh, physical evidence and trace evidence. Uh, primarily, you have the first responders, the patrolmen, they're going to get the call, they're going to go there, they're going to do their thing, and by that, they go up, they assess the situation, they figure out what's going on, they're looking to make sure the scene's safe, and then they're going, once the scene's safe, they're going to take a look and see, okay, do, what, what kind of crime has been committed here, and if it's a death, or if it's a burglary, or a robbery, or any of those types of things, that's where they're going to do the, okay, it's time that I get uh, somebody out here to give me a hand. So, these are the things about physical evidence. The patrolmen, those guys, you know, they know their stuff. Uh, being CSI is not something that's, uh, it's a specialty, but it's not like something that's super hard and takes rocket science to do. If it was, I couldn't do it. But it does take a little bit of attention to detail. And uh, I like to work slow and methodical, so it's a good job for me. That's just to make sure everybody's had their coffee this morning. I haven't had mine yet, so that's my fault. Okay, I use the acronym ADAPT here, um, but these are the things that the first responder is going to do. And, you know, it's not like they walk right up there and go, okay, ching, now I go and I'm going to start arresting people. <clears throat> you know, everybody has their own style. And even though we're not on camera being filmed for television shows, we are on camera being filmed daily, as I'm sure you've all read and heard about as recently. So whenever you're out in a uniform, no matter whose, or you're out, even if you're just, and I don't mean no disrespect, but having been called this before, just a security guard, uh, you know, you're still, you're wearing a uniform and you're representing an entity that's responsible for protection of property and life. So, come on down, you're the next contestant. Um, so, 
always be aware. Somebody is uh, somebody is watching you, not just a little kid on the street anymore. But we're going to arrest if they're there, domestic violence, you'll get into probably stuff like that. Kansas has a, well, basically an automatic arrest. Uh, detain, identify, get statements from witnesses, accessing the scene. Uh, there's assessment and then there's an access. First you gotta assess to make sure it's safe to do so, but you're gonna access the scene, you're gonna determine where most of the evidence is at and how you're gonna approach in and out of that scene because you don't wanna come in from this side, then 10 minutes later this side, and then you're gonna set one entry exit point and that's gonna be the sole place you use. So you want that to be where your least amount of evidence is if possible. So that's the accessing of the scene. Uh, and then of course scene protection. We all see the tape, we see the cars out there. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna tape off your crime scene. If this room is the crime scene, I'm probably gonna have multiple scenes anyway. Um, but this may be a dump scene or a secondary scene. It could even be a tertiary scene. It may or may not be the primary scene, depending upon where the crime happened. But where is most of your evidence going to be? obviously where the crime happened and where the uh, end result so, oh where it ended up yeah that's going to be where you're going to find your two main bodies of evidence but you always want to be able to think outside the box and think, okay how did it get from there to here did somebody throw it in the back of the truck and haul it here if so we got to find that truck we got to find the car etc uh and you're always taking notes so Nowadays, with uh, hazards and things that go on, crime scenes have become death traps. Uh, working meth labs, I did that for a while, and people would always set up explosive booby traps. <coughs> so you have a crime scene where the person who is deceased is dealing drugs, happens a lot. Um, chances are he or she may have something set up to because most importantly, as a businessman, you want to protect your business asset. So if you got your dope in your closet, you're probably going to have a little some kind of a warning device. Or if the people that want to come take your dope, and that's called a business takeover, and <laughs> they want to come in, take your dope, and then go and sell it their way, you probably need some kind of protective device. And we have run across those, uh, particularly our SWAT guys. And we get trained in that, not necessarily in the diffusing of, but in the looking for and uh, documenting that. So these are the things you're gonna do. Even though the suspect did a bad thing, he or she is a human being, we gotta treat them with some sense of dignity because they have more rights than you and I. Usually I get a chuckle. There is some element of seemingly truth to that. Uh, <clears throat> seemingly is the key word there. So we will treat them at least as a person and professionally. And the main thing is we want to keep them right there. We want to make sure we isolate them, not just to keep them uh, high and dry for the detectives, but I'm probably going to be taking the clothes. So uh, that's going to be evidence that I'm going to need as well as the evidence in, within the scene and the victim. Render first aid. If the if it's too late to render first aid, usually you'll find telltale signs of that. And uh, you have the person comes in as a domestic. By the time you get there, first responder realizes, okay, this person, um, they're laying in the middle floor. They've got this gash on their head. Um, but <coughs> there's a little bit of gurgling going on. I should probably summon the some extra help. That's first and foremost what we want to do. So they're going to get there, they're going to do their thing, and if the person does go deceased, they go from emergency medical technicians to evidence mangling technicians. And I'm not really fond of them. They have a job to do, so no disrespect to them, but they, they really do wreck a crime scene for me. And, and then they want to run off. They don't want to stick around and tell me what they did and why this is that way. So it's a love-hate relationship. 
some of the duties at the scene. We're going to get there. The uh, whoops. the uh, first responding officer is going to start this process, setting up the tape. You always want your scene to be bigger because you can't make your scene bigger later. So if this was a dump site, I'm probably going to cordon off the entire building. And anybody that's in it is now going to stay there until we can get statements. So anybody that any places around it, access points, we're going to have that. So in essence, you could in fact have this whole portion portion of the campus being a crime scene, or at least being roped off. Because then, as we need to collapse it, we can do that. Whereas you don't really want to expand it after you're done because your evidence is already ruined if there is anything out there. And this is probably one of the biggest. We all get excited. We all want to go in and do our part, but sometimes we don't watch where we step. And you know, even us CSI guys would be around and we'd be taking our pictures and there's the shell casing on the ground and ka-ting, ting, ting, ting. No, I'd never done that. <laughs> situation like that, you just want to <clears throat> put it in your report. Yeah, I think the damn thing half a block or whatever it was. Because you want to document it. Um, these are the th additional things that we're looking for. Vehicles are probably going to be, because uh, you got to, if, if at the very least the suspect's going to have to drive there to perpetrate the crime or get a ride from somebody. So there's always going to be a vehicle somewhere involved. And it's just a matter of finding that. Securing your scene, you don't want anybody around there. The other reason for having your, your crime scene out there larger is when the media comes around, you want to keep them at bay because in the middle of working the scene, <coughs> we're not going to have time to talk to them. So and I've actually had them walk up. Hey, can you give a statement? Uh, no. Where did you come from? Well, there was nobody over there, so I just went over that tape. You might want to turn around and go back because now I can take you to jail. But I'm not going to do that because my hands are a little messy right now and I don't have time. And then I'm looking for that deputy going, You, come hither. <laughs> Why? Because thou violate my crime scene. I went to RenFest last week, it was great. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so then they'll escort them out. We usually have a PIO or somebody that's going to, we'll tell, we're nice to the media, say, hey, look, right now, can't give you a statement, but we have a PIO, here's a number. Or if you'll wait at a designated area, somebody will be along to give you a statement. And most of them here in Shawnee County and Topeka area are pretty good. I don't know about how the big cities were. Uh, oh, there were they, vultures up there. I was going to say, I imagine they could be sharks, but uh, they've worked with us enough that usually if we say, hey, not right now, you know, go see so and so, they're like, oh, okay. And they'll, they'll turn around and they'll leave. Most of them, again, won't violate that tape, but they will try to lean in as far as they can. So I have to ask them, well, you have these big, powerful cameras that you could see a gnat on the floor from a half a mile away and put that on the news, but you want to get in and lean over my tape. What's up with that? So, well, you can see as much as I can see. Okay, well, you need to wait over there and we'll get you statements. We'll, and you can still see what you need to see, but out of respect for the victim and the family, please be careful what you show and don't show. And this. Channel 13 is one of the better ones, too. So, enough on that. Crime scene log. We always got to know who came, who went, what time, and why they were there. So, there's always paperwork, as I said. Uh, the guy who gets to be the log dog, um, or girl, as the case might be, um, there, all that requires is standing at the entrance of the scene and getting names times and a purpose so you have over here uh, a reason why this person's in there obviously 
the first responding officer is going to be there for a reason. And once they get things calmed down, they're probably going to start this, and then they may trans uh, hand it off to somebody else, especially if it's around shift grade, because you know crime never happens uh, within an eight to five room. It always happens on a weekend when I want to do something else, but I'm on call and I want to go and have some fun, then I got somebody that wants to call me out and have me do some work. Yeah. It's a nerve. But crime is never an eight to five thing, so you're always, things like this are always gonna happen with shift change and whatever. And that's good, I haven't bored you to sleep yet, so I appreciate that. Uh, evidence, the definition of, which I'm sure you're all familiar with already, there's probably multiple definitions, but the key thing is, to me, is the physical item that tends to prove or disprove the commission of a crime. So whatever all the other definitions say, I think if you have that in there, you're good. In our job, one of the things we need to be able to do is recognize evidence, because if we can't, we're in trouble. We've slept through our training at some point in time. So you think, in, Thinking outside the box again. You got your crime scene, but you also want to think of, okay, if I'm coming into this room, uh, obviously there's only one portal of entry, so that's easy. But if I'm coming into a gymnasium and it happened, you know, what, what's the more likely approach? So it gets interesting at times. And we love cameras in terms of surveillance cameras because they do a very good job of telling uh, why somebody Maybe not why somebody was there, but that somebody was there. We're concerned with the who, what, when, where, and the why is kind of iffy. I don't really care so much about the why, because do you really know why a person does what they do? I mean, you find out maybe, but I'm more concerned with who, what, when, where, and how. I like to know how, because that's, what, that's just me. And plus, if you dwell on why, after years, you start going crazy because you can't figure out why people want to kill themselves because people just do what people do. Everybody has their demons that they have to deal with. Uh, types of evidence. Um, anything can be a weapon. Body fluids, impressions. These are everything from fingerprints to castings to uh, soft <coughs> castings or micro seal type tool marks, impressions, things like this. Um, there's a stuff called microsil that we use that's really great. It's like silly putty. So a lot of you are old enough to remember silly putty. Uh, and then, you know, you can make a ball balance. You can put it on the funny page and lift off the, that's kind of what this microsil does. But I found out it doesn't bounce very high. It kind of goes splat and went out again. And you got a mess with it. So trace and transfer evidence, dirt and dust. Dust is, I go to homes and the, the ladies of the homes are usually like, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. Well, man, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. I mean, it's, yeah, you were a victim, but you know, it happens. Oh, I'm not embarrassed about that. Or the fact that the guy dumps the drawer that has all the toys in it. You know, they're usually not too embarrassed about that. And then some of y'all getting a little freaky out there. <laughs> um, uh, they're not embarrassed about that. They're embarrassed about the dust. Oh, I haven't dusted in three days. And I sit there and think, man, I haven't dusted my house ever. <laughs> so, good Lord. That's not totally true, but it's always a long time. Uh, but dust is a good thing for us. Because if somebody picks up something, if somebody moves something, I can see where an item was sitting. I can see where they touched to lift that print from dust. Uh, even with a static dust lifter, I'm not gonna be able to do that depending upon the surface. But with today's photography using the digital cameras, I can get some great detail. Recording evidence, camera is the main thing. When we're somewhere, we're always taking pictures. And uh, it may be still photos, one of the things we're gonna do when we get there, we're gonna take still photos. We're probably gonna take video. The cameras nowadays, you can put a card in and you can do video. 
without having to get the big fancy cumbersome camera from yesteryear. And then we're going to be doing um, scene diagrams or sketches. And this is one version. <coughs> There's three or four in here. This one's my favorite just because it's easier and I can whip through it pretty fast. So straight line. Right angle coordinates, same thing. These are just different types. Um, just using, showing a different way to do it with a baseline versus right angles and triangulation. These are great. This is great. I use this a lot for indoor scenes uh, for knowing if I've got a body in there to be able to later on go back and, uh, and put that body within the, the measurements of this. And nowadays we have Faro, we have Leica, we have all of these scene diagramming computer systems that are fantastic, especially when you look at how much they cost. Um, but they do an excellent job done with all computer algorithms and all that. So you computer guys out and gals out there, um, you're already echelons above me because I'm doing good to turn one on. But um, those are excellent because we can diagram a fatality crash scene, an indoor crime scene, an outdoor crime scene. We can do this using this, this technology and hooks up to a satellite. And the end result is I go in court, they put it on a monitor and I start testifying and I start describing the scene and I can hit a button and it'll fly you through the scene. They got three dimensions. It's kind of like being in a, being Luke going down the Death Star, you know, it's really kind of cool. So technology is cool. I just am not a very good operator of it. But this is our first and foremost method. And yeah, it's a little dated. Now we have digital cameras. <laughs> but the concept is still the same. So this is what we're, we're trying to do is document our scene. And this would be why. Because when I go to court later on, I get a DA or a defense attorney that goes, well, why did you do what you do? I like to be a little funny in court sometimes, and I'll look at him and go, well, why do you do what you do? Well, that, I'm asking the questions here. Okay, fair enough. Well, I do that because that's my job. Well, how do you go about doing your job? So then I explain all that. Uh, but we, the specialized analysis, if I have evidence that I'm collecting, eventually that evidence is going to go to a laboratory because unlike the show CSI, I don't collect it, go back to my enclosed glass lab, break it out, put it through, put every, all these little samples and everything through and hit a button and watch it dance across this big screen and then measure up and then go, oh, we have a match. It's Frankenstein in the library with a candlestick, you know, I mean, I don't do that because that requires a degree in those specialized fields. I have one in sociology and anthropology and a master's degree in criminal justice and I could still only be a cop. So that's not a bad thing. I like that. So I'm not making money. So we don't do it for the money. And I'm sure a lot of you have figured that out. But it is fun and it's never the same thing twice. Unfortunately, there are you're kind of waiting for bad things to happen to other people in my line of work. Because I don't like the fact that somebody has to be a victim for me to go to work. Uh, and I definitely don't like it when they, when they die. Uh, photo equipment, I mean, nowadays, we have so many types of photogra uh, photographing equipment out there <coughs> and the filters and everything that we can use. Alternate light sources kind of goes in with the UV light filters and the orange light filters, the colored light filters, orange, green, yellow, red, and all that's gonna do is it eliminates certain light waves from, co from coming in so that using an alternate light source, I can view items of evidence and I can get things like saliva to fluoresce, uh, semen fluoresces, kind of a white, uh, yellowy kind of color. Um, blood is always black under a blue light. Um, so little things like this that you can look. 
and it'll actually help you read a crime scene when you're looking at this stuff. Uh, and they've made leaps and bounds in technology improvement from the simple blue light system that I used when I first started, which was attach a blue light to a mag <laughs> light with an orange shield and run around with my Ray-Ban goggles and put lights on everything and find fingerprints and blood and whatever else I'm looking for. Now, I got a thing that's about this big around and I can sit here and I can shine in on everything. And so it's great. There's all kinds of toys out there uh, and we all like toys. Film's kind of gone by the wayside, but uh, black and white still is a preferred medium for a lot of uh, dealing with crime scenes because you get, you have a lot of colors, but with the black and white, you see it for what it is. So you can see some details in that black and white that you may or may not be able to see in color. Um, these are just some photographic recommendations. Uh, this one's always good, 400 speed, pretty much everything. Nighttime, you're probably looking at it at 800, but 400 still works for you if you've got plenty of light. Or you can make light or you can paint by light. And we'll get into some of that here. Some of that's kind of common sense. I don't know about y'all, but I have to read the manual and everything because uh, unless I'm sitting in a class and somebody's telling me how to do it, I'm technology, technologically challenged, I guess would be the right word. Um, this one, I don't like anybody else in the scene, but ideally in crime scene, we want to work in as a team. You're going to have somebody that's going to take pictures. You're going to have somebody that's going to do the sketch. You're going to have somebody identifying the evidence. Somebody is marking the evidence. Somebody is then going around, and once it's been properly uh, diagrammed or, or photo documented, then somebody is coming in behind and collecting that. Uh, in an ideal situation, you have an, ev an evidence response team that's going to do that. Uh, not in Shawnee County. It's usually, I have three, two other deputies that work for me, so, and I'm a working sergeant, as I like to say, because I don't get the luxury of telling other people to go do something. I, I have to go out and do it too. And that's good, keeps my skills up and that's really the way it should be. So we don't have that fancy evidence team. It's usually one guy or gal doing everything. So that's the cold hard reality. Even in some of the bigger agencies, you may have two or three people helping you, but ultimately it boils down to who's gonna be the one at the end that does all the paperwork. And that's the guy who explains it all in court or gal. Um, so just things to, to be aware of. Mid-range photos, close-up photos, all that means is I'm going to have a lar one large photo, probably an aerial photo of Washburn campus, <coughs> and then I'm going to have a large photo coming in slightly of the area where the building is or where the crime is believed to have occurred. Excuse me. And then I'm going to have a photo of the building. Then I'm going to have a photo within the building leading to the room. I'm going to have an overall of the room. Then I'm going to have each time I'm getting smaller and smaller. And we do that, and you'll see here, uh, enable to, it enables us to document the scene from large to small, right down to that finally that one little piece of evidence that's laying there on the floor. Accidents in Shawnee County, we also do fatality accidents, so we're not, we're not just doing one type of crime. Everything from simple thefts to burglaries to major cases, homicide or rape or anything that, that constitutes a crime that they need us to come out and do the documentation on, we're going to be the ones to do it. These are our most common. Uh, but when we're taking pictures, uh, you know, I see patrolmen, they like to take their pen and they like to put it down next to a knife or something. Well, it gives perspective, but that pen 
it's not really a preferred instrument to give perspective. We want to use scales. And I tell him, I said, hey, if you need some scales, I got tons of them. Come see me. I'll give them to you. It ain't going to cost you anything. Oh, you can put them in a bag so you don't have to find a place in your control car to stick them. But please use them. And after you use them at a particularly nasty one, just throw it away. Don't give it back to me. I don't want it. <laughs> or don't keep it and use it for the next one. Uh, that's just not good. Uh, come see me and I'll give you more. But, well, I didn't get over there, so all I had was this one. So that's kind of one of those deals. We always want to put scale, and that comes in later on because when I send the stuff to the KBI, fingerprints especially, I'm collecting fingerprints at a scene, I'm gonna photograph those prints. I want to do a one-to-one -one scale because when the examiner takes them in and he opens up that, he's gonna put it on a computer screen called APHIS. He's gonna take a picture of it with a one-to-one -one scale. They're gonna submit that and then APHIS is gonna kick up samples, and then he or she is gonna sit there and look at the first three. There's more to it than that, but in a nutshell, that's, that's APHIS. Um, so, tool impressions, shoe prints. Shoe prints are just like fingerprints. You're looking for characteristics in the shoe, things that are identifiable if the person walks on the inside of their shoes, on the outside, if they walk on their heels, if they walk on the balls of their feet, whatever the situation might be, all of this is going to be evident in wear patterns, and so we're looking at wear patterns. And then we get search warrants, go to the suspect's house, and hopefully find his or her shoes. And then we can do further comparison to those shoes, because we have enough. Crimes against persons, these are the things we're looking at. Obviously, the injuries, uh, the environment, um, and any crime, you always want to include photos of the crowd, at least I do, because if nothing else, you always find somebody that you tried to contact later, and well, uh, I'm not going to be available, or well, well, who's this person, so you find out who, whatever their reason for not wanting to say anything, uh, maybe they truly don't know anything, <coughs> but usually they know a little bit of something, and not too many people walk up to you and say, hey, I'm here to be your witness. Let me tell you about the Joneses and everything that they did, because I always tried to keep up with the Joneses. Most of the time, you got to go. They're, they're willing to talk to you, but they want you to, well, show me that you want to talk to me. Show me you care what I have to say. So come look me up, find me, and then talk to me. Tell me what it is. I'll tell you what you want to know if I know, but I want you to truly show me you genuinely care. Clothing defensive wounds. These are things that uh, the defensive wounds on the victim, that's going to credit him or her later in court because the defense attorney's job is to discredit that victim and any of hers or his statements. And Anybody here going to be an attorney? I told you it was a good class. <laughs> you are? Yeah. Or just thinking about it maybe? Okay, well... <laughs> no, I'm sorry, that, I wasn't being mean. Attorneys, we need them. They're, they're like cops. We're necessary evil, so are they. You got to have, we got to make sure our constitutional rights are defended. They're bad and ugly, so that's actually, I applaud that. That's very good. Lots of schooling ahead of you. Wish you luck. But come to the, don't go to the dark side. No. Come to the good side. Wear the white hat. Everybody's still awake. Fires, we'll, we have a fire marshal's office that primarily investigates fires and arson crimes, uh, but I've had some training in it, so I'll go out. Typically, any of your fire uh, companies, your fire stations, they've always got a fire investigator within the fire department uh, or somebody on the rig or, or somebody within the command staff of, the, of that particular firehouse who's got the fire investigative training. So they can go in once they extinguish the fire and make a determination, hey, yeah, this is not an accidental fire. So either we're gonna work it as a Topeka Fire Department or are we gonna call in the state fire marshal's office and have one of their guys and gals come in and work it. They'll make that determination. But these are things, uh, obviously, you wanna know where it started? That's always a good thing. 
And usually there's telltale signs. You figure in a fire, well, all your evidence is gone. But actually, a much good majority of it is, but actually there's still something there that you can work with. You've always got a point of origin. You've always got something that shows you right where it started. You've got little things like light bulbs that don't break and they will actually point in the direction where the fire started because the heat melts that, that light bulb glass. So you can follow it and go, okay. And you go over there, sure enough, there's an area that looks like a point of origin. So then you're looking for the cause and you're looking for uh, poor patterns, cooling, anything like that that's gonna indicate an accelerant. Just the smell alone. Uh, once you get down and start moving the debris aside, if somebody's used gasoline or kerosene, oh man, it's like, McFly, I'm right here. And you can see it, you know. So that was for the camera. Got it. <laughs> we'll make a note of the time on the film. Okay. Send it to the sheriff. He'll get a kick out of that. Uh, so again, photo methodology. We always do a card because this gives the information that they need, particularly the case number, who took the pictures, and the, the DAs, they love that because then they know who to subpoena primarily, and then they don't have, they can still read through, they still have to read through the reports. But earlier I was talking about overall photos of a scene. This is gonna be kind of a quick down and dirty, but this is the overall of a particular area of interest within a burglary, and so now we found, well, there's something, the victim says, well, my cell phone was taken and uh, this box is normally kept in this pot on the end table, but now it's been moved. So somebody touched it. And I know, because I've watched CSI, that when somebody touches something, you guys can pick it up and you can take it and you can find the person and then you'll have them in custody by five o'clock. rarely we have had it happen maybe not by five o'clock but we've had them caught within the same day but that's not because of anything we do that's because all the guys and gals that are out there are beating the streets and they're they're the ones that do it so it's a team effort but this would be a mid-range photo because you're showing the the actual piece that has potential evidence on it that you want to look at and lo and behold, hey, we have a pretty good fingerprint here. We got all kinds of minutia. We have a core, uh, that's always good to have. And then you have all the ridges and the furrows and each of those tell a story because you have minutia within those of bifurcations, islands, ending ridges, beginning ridges, uh, ridges that, uh, that have that go along and then suddenly they do weird things and they start going and bifurcate, trifurcate, and doing all kinds of things. Then you have a, usually somewhere around in here, probably because this looks to be more like a loop. No, that's gonna be a, that's not a loop. That's gonna be a central loop pocket, probably, something like that. So over in here, which is obliterated, there would be a delta. And that's a, that's a piece that was used for identifying fingerprints with, and you'll learn all that when the fingerprint guy comes. So, but help the fingerprint guy. We're gonna take a picture without, then we're gonna mark it, and we're gonna label it, and we're gonna take a picture again, and then we're gonna take another picture of it with the scale, because this is that one-to-one -one I was talking about. And then when the examiner puts it on the computer, it's gonna show up and then he's gonna go in and retrace all of these ridges and identify all these minutia points and actually trace it all out on the computer and then that's gonna help the computer kick up the next three possible people that this fingerprint may belong to if they're in the system. And then that's in a nutshell how we will capture that. Um, considerations for photographs, uh, I'll kind of bleed through this, I mean, because it's taking pictures, but these are definitely things that you want to, that you need. You need to have good depth of field and lighting. After all, that's what a camera does. It takes, it uses light. So anybody can take pictures, but 
you want to make sure that you have a little bit of idea. You don't want to use too much flash. Uh, you don't want to use, and I say too much because a lot of them, if you put the flash right on there, it whites it all out. But if you tip the flash up, you can bounce it off walls and you can get a little bit of flash coming in. Plus when you're photographing shoe prints, you're gonna be taking it from all sides. Oblique lighting is good, shows shadows. It may show a particular wear pattern, a rock or a nail in a shoe. We had a case just a little brief where the guy had taken and put nails in the bottom of his tennis shoes, kind of like the hobnail boots from back in the day. And he had done this and he had gone out and he perpetrated his acts. And one of the things that we found was some good shoe prints at the scene. And we kind of had an idea uh, that it was a past employee. So that's always a good lead. So then the detectives did their thing because they're not out doing all this stuff. Is that, no, you do that, you get dirty. And we're gonna get our khakis all dirty. And I don't wanna, and then I have to loosen my tie. And you know, I have to take my suit coat off and that's just, uh, so I'm gonna get all dirty. So there's a difference between us and detectives. Some agencies, they include CSI as detectives. A lot of agencies, your detective is also your CSI. And he's also the guy who may have to preserve and then later dispose of the evidence. So uh, depending upon the size of the agency, you could be one guy doing the job of 20 people or one woman doing the job of 20 men. Doesn't that sound much better? Yeah. And probably normal, right? Behind every good man is a better woman. At least that's what I tell my wife. Gotta keep them happy. <laughs> uh, and that's on camera too. <laughs> so, uh, finger, or, uh, photographs. So we're gonna be looking at trying to capture these, these anomalies, not anomalies, but these little features and characteristics within a photograph that's gonna aid in identification later. Uh, but as detectives, they have their thing to do. They do follow-up, they do more intricate, detailed follow-up than a patrolman has time to do, and certainly more than I have time to do. And then they're gonna actually bring the people in, interview them, bring the suspect or suspects in, interview them, and then that may turn into an interrogation once we, CSI, da -da -da -da, has provided them with all of the evidence that they need to bring the guy in and turn the interview into an interrogation. So we're separate, but we do the dirty job, they get the glory, that's how I look at it. And that's okay. Um, I was always that kid that always liked to play in the dirt anyway, so heck, why not? I'll be that adult that likes to play in the dirt. That's why fire scenes are really cool with the work. Um, but anyway, that's photo considerations on there, external flashes. Uh, there's several ways that you can do, I talked about side lighting, uh, oblique lighting, which is the same thing. Painting with light, I'll show you some examples of that. We'll show you, you've seen some camera uh, pictures in here, um, but probably uh, if you don't have all the fancy equipment to do paint with light and that requires additional flashes, putting them out along the perimeter of your scene or within the area that you're gonna take pictures. You can cheat, you can use patrol cars, uh, but keep in mind certain types of lighting, fluorescent lighting is sometimes better than the lighting that you get off of headlights because you have that yellow tint, although nowadays I think most of the cars, they got blue lights now. Um, and then if we have our red and blue lights going, that throws more lighting anomalies in there, so you wanna turn all that off. And then you've got people that inevitably uh, those patrolmen that are out there and they want to walk in front of your lights right when you're taking pictures And so you get this big mass shadow in there. It looks like something off of Ghost Adventures, which is cool But you don't really want that in court. So you got to take a picture again or tell everybody. Okay, I'm taking pictures And I have this thing when I'm going and I'm taking pictures of the scene I'll pull out my camera and I'll say okay, I'm gonna take pictures now and usually 
the lieutenants or the other sergeants or somebody, even up higher rank might be there and they're standing there and they're like, oh, yeah, okay. That's their one warning because then when I start taking pictures, if you're in my picture, you get a subpoena because your name and everything goes in my report. And then it, you get a subpoena from the courts as to why you were in the middle of his pictures. Did you really get me? Yes, I did. I told you I'm taking pictures and you turn and look at me like I just shot your cat. So now you're getting a subpoena. Oh man, really? Come on, sorry, really? Yeah, really. So we'll let the DA's office decide if they need you or don't need you. But one thing that keeps the sheriff or the chief or whoever your bosses are, after you do that one time and you say, okay, I'm taking pictures, it's like roaches. <laughs> so then it's like, yeah, now I got to see them myself. Um, a nighttime po photo with just a flash. Keep in mind with SLR cameras, you're only going to be able to see <coughs> the flash is only going to go maybe 8 to 10 feet in front of you. Even the bigger cameras like what we're going to use or your more in-depth uh, cameras, uh, you may have a 10 feet. Maybe you can extend that flash out an extra 5 feet. Uh, but you're still, this is what you're going to get. So you've got all this around you. And um, this is just a training photo. So nothing actually happened at this ball diamond. But it gives you an idea of what you're normally going to get. This is your normal picture using a, a regular flash. Now, if you paint with light or have other outside light coming in, you've opened up all of this back area. So you can maybe see if there's tracks that lead off over to here and through the fence, or if there's something over here of interest, or maybe, you know, there's a car parked back in here, uh, whatever it is that you're doing, but this is a, a, an example of painting with light. And this, this works good during nighttime fatality investigations too, um, but it can be a pain to set up. So you can use car light, headlights, spotlights, but you gotta, try to, because with spotlights you have just one little area that gets lit, so you have to position the cars and tell everybody, you know, you parked here and you feel like uh, you're working at the car lot, uh, parking cars. But once you get it all set up, it can be used and it does work, because something is better than nothing. But then you have to explain <coughs> all that in court. So. One of the questions you get a lot of in court is representation of a true and accurate crime scene. Is this, I get that question, is this photograph a true and accurate representation of the scene as you saw it that day? And uh, even the uh, prosecuting attorneys don't like me because I go, yes, insofar as a two-dimensional picture can show. And they're like, yes, can we just say yes? <laughs> but with all the tech and, I, and my method and my madness is with all the technology that we have, have out there with Faro 3D and I don't know is there 4D and 5D now hell I don't know but you've got at least 2D 3D you've got all these different ways of, of presenting a crime scene and so if I'm using a 3D image over a 2D image which image is going to be better the 3D it's going to sh show height it's going to show depth as opposed to my photograph that shows, well, yes, that's the body that was laying there in the middle of the floor in room 112. Okay, and then they'll go on with their question. Uh, but I always throw that in there because then the defense attorney wants to play his or her games with, well, now you said that was accurate. Now, is that more accurate than this and this? And I'm sitting there hoping that the DA is gonna do the objection or whatever. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So that's my only caveat to a true and accurate representation. Um, with technology, what it is, I think, <coughs> other than just liking to be a pain in the ass to attorneys, that's, that's my reasoning for doing that. Uh, obviously, if you didn't put it there, don't pick it up. I have detectives that want to come in and, and patrol them and they go, well, the gun was laying there in the hand, but I picked it up and I, I put it in my car. Was there a reason why you picked it? Well, it was just laying there and I didn't want somebody to get a hold of it. Was there other people here? No, it was just me. 
Were you gonna go over there and get a hold of it? Well, no, but you did, huh? Well, you went over there and you got a hold of it and you picked it up and put it in your car. Why did you move it if there was no chance of danger? There was no reason for you to do that. Uh, I don't know. Put it in your report that you moved it and you can explain that because I'm gonna put in my report that you moved it. It was moved when I got here. We want it left there as the bottom line. Because like if you have somebody that shot themselves, if that gun's still in their hand, we can see, the coroner investigator can see by the way the gun is being <coughs> held or where it's fallen in relation to where the body is, maybe which side, which hand it was kept in, or if it's still in the hand, uh, there's impressions from the metal or the fixtures on the gun that are gonna be left in the skin as death occurs. Uh, you don't have that flow of blood, so you're gonna leave actual impressions of whatever it is that you touched if it was heavy enough in the skin, in your hand. So we can actually marry that image up with that, and that's a good photograph. Photograph uh, speaks a thousand words or something like that. About 20 minutes, so we can go to 10.45. Okay. Um, so here is marking evidence. I'm gonna kind of whip through some of this. This is just, I mean, it's all, this is how we're gonna mark it. Because uh, I want to show you guys, so we all come and want to see the pictures, so I got pictures. These are some of our packaging mediums. Uh, here's the, the gun box, action's open. The ammo is never stored with the gun for safety. We put that in that versus in that because if there are prints on the gun, I can preserve those prints better here than in here because when I pick up the plastic and I move the bag around, it's going to actually wipe the prints off. If it's got blood and goober all over it, I'm gonna put it in paper. Um, if I've got some other items, paint cans we use for arson, uh, certain kinds of things we'll use for, for uh, syringes and whatnot, um, because we don't wanna get ourselves or anybody else stuck. And it's usually me that would probably be the one that gets stuck, just the way my life runs. So, when you're at the scene, you sh we have all of the proper stuff we need, but sometimes you run out and those film cases, not only do the suspects or the dopers like them to put their dope in, but we can actually put fragments and stuff inside those too. So they do serve a multi-purpose for law enforcement use as well as for criminal use. Um, Again, packaging biohazards, that's our main concern. We wanna make sure that we're not taking any stuff from somebody else and that's getting on, on another person or on a surface that the, that's used on a regular basis and we're gonna contaminate that surface. So biohazards would be blood, urine, feces, uh, <coughs> saliva, things, uh, certain types of liquid drugs or other kinds of poisons that might be out there, that's gonna be a hazard that we don't wanna take on to other people. Uh, large property items, we have to take it all. Uh, so, I mean, if I need to, I call a tow truck. They actually have a pickup truck now, they'll come out, it's got a lift, they'll put our, we have lawnmowers and small tractors out in the county that get stolen, so we can use a tow truck for that. Um, alcohol, kegs. Mostly what we do with that kind of stuff, we take it, we photograph it, we return the kegs to the owners. We're looking for the, we'll, we'll maintain the smaller containers for court purposes as part of evidence. Weapons, sharps, electronics, firearms. Again, you can never place those. No kinds of explosives do we keep in the property room. I have explosives down there, but it's in a different safe, and that's for our canine guys to train with. Uh, but we don't actually keep that. That goes to, we contact the bomb squad, Pika PD. They come out, they do their thing, they take it to an undisclosed location, and then it gets stored there until they get enough, and then they spend a Friday afternoon blowing stuff up. Um, so, yeah, bomb squad's cool. Um, Taser cartridges, we keep those because that's a use of force. 
I've had to activate my taser on somebody, I'm gonna need that later on in court. And my reports are gonna indicate why I did what I had to do. Uh, I've got unexploded devices. We, don't, we may take fragments of exploded devices to keep uh, for further testing uh, to find out what kind of gunpowder or what kind of explosive element it was used in. We have, I also uh, run the property room. I am the evidence custodian, so my other job is to make sure that all evidence is collected, is preserved in the state that it's in, we don't change it, and it's ready to go to court as is. Uh, and then I, once it's all done with court, <coughs> and certain times, the statute of limitations have run out, then we go in and we will dispose of those items. Sergeant Lewis, just a quick question. Besides yourself, who has access to the evidence room, the evidence storage room? Uh, in my unit, it's gonna be me and my two property techs. I have two civilian property techs, and I have another civilian who is my records person, and then I have my two deputies. Now, my two deputies have access to it, but they turn in their evidence, somebody else logs it in, the property techs log it in to the, the property room itself, so there isn't any any potential questions for, well, you collected this and you logged it in and you stored it? No, we have people that that's their job to do so that we don't raise those questions that the attorneys want to look at and go, well, why did you do this? So very limited access to that. Limited industry. access, only those within the unit. And those that don't, belong to the unit when they come in, they're escorted. So we have these little key fobs, so they buzz in, it goes to a computer, tells who and what time, and then one of us or the property tech will escort them through uh, the property room so that I'm not over here and the officer is around the corner where I can't see him, maybe helping himself to a little bit extra stuff. Um, so that's why we have that. Sexual assault kits, I'm sure there's an article out there. Uh, well, there is. Uh, there was a big study done. All agencies submit those now. I know we always have, unless for some reason the lab tells us now we're not going to do anything with it or we can't do anything with it, then we will submit it to the FBI. But typically all of our stuff goes to the KBI. Uh, trace evidence, this is what trace evidence is hairs, fibers, and items, excuse me. Um, so the difference between your, your physical evidence, fingerprints, and, shot, and uh, um, bullets, or things like that. This is just a, we provide this for the officers. This is, have you done all this? If you haven't done any of this, then you're wrong. This is our, uh, Evidence sheet, this is one of the copies, this is the paperwork side. So when you collect something, you, you, you write all the information in, case number, who it is, where you got it from, where you collected it from, where the original offense location was, what the type of it is, what it is, quantity of one to five or however many, and then you describe it in here. And then you're gonna, you're the collector, so you're gonna sign it over. This is the chain of custody. Chain of custody is, important when dealing with evidence because when it comes to my property from me that I collected it then it goes to my property room then it's all entered in the computer and then when I have to go to court I go back in each time I pull it out even if I pull it out just to look at it I have to sign it out because it says a date and time as to when that was handled and why well if you just wanted to review it sometimes I have to go back well for my report I need to add and was this okay yeah and then i'll sign it back in i may have only held it for a half a second but i still have to sign it out sign it back in self-protection for officers is we have to seize monies because when you're dealing with large sums of money particularly drug money um, we all read about how well there was half a million dollars there and when it went to the property room there was only three hundred thousand there where did the other 200,000 go? Well, there's no record of it. Well, it was with so-and-so and so-and-so of the Drug Enforcement Unit when they turned it in. A 
like they did get lost in the property or anything? Chances are no, because we would find that. Or if it did, who in the property room messed with it? So this is a protection paper that we use, as is this, a drug seizure report. Uh, anytime, any amount of drugs, you got a net gross weight, grams, ounces, pounds, or trace, a field test, uh, whether it tested positive, the type of drug it tested positive for, uh, and then if you want further drug testing at the KBI. If there's gonna be charges, there, you're always gonna have it tested at the KBI through chemistry. Um, if you don't have a suspect, you just found it, there's no need to have it tested, but we still have to have it annotated as marijuana or meth or whatever it is, because when it comes time to destroy it, I do a separate report up to my bosses and say, this is what was destroyed. If we have property, we're gonna return back to you. It's a car. Rather than have you bring your car into the courthouse, because that's gonna be almost impossible, we're gonna take pictures of it. You're gonna identify it as yours using this form. And then we're gonna use that photo affidavit as you attest under penalty of perjury that it is yours. And then we're gonna use the pictures we took of the car as the evidence in the case. Property disposition form. Anytime we're gonna get rid of property or release property, we have the case officer sign one of these. It's more of that checks and balances for us. Uh, our digital media taking pictures. This is kind of a property uh, form that we use, but uh, when they were captured, what the date number is, and the photographer, and then we fill out all this out here when we actually put it into the computer. Because for us, photographs are supplement evidence. It's not something we're going to keep in the uh, property room. Uh, and then when we're going to collect body samples from you, then we're going to blood, blood breath, urine, hair, saliva, or nails or other items underneath, uh, then if we have your consent, we'll have you fill out one of these. Legal considerations, I won't go into that, because that's probably, if it hasn't already been discussed, that's always gonna be an underlying element within your, your, your uh, study here and throughout the career if you're pursuing law or if you're pursuing law enforcement. But, Obviously, the Constitution is our guideline, so we want to make sure if we need a search warrant or we have consent or we've done that and followed that. Outdoor scenes, these are some of the problems that we've encountered. And we kind of went over a lot of that, um, but shotgun through a lot of that stuff at the end. Are there any questions so far? Need to stand up, stretch, yawn, scratch, whatever it is you need to do. Just careful what you scratch. Some of these, uh, I've got a couple of post mortem 